Introducing our last speaker of the day, Professor Edmund Phelps, I am faced with the daunting task of capturing the 2006 Nobel Prize winning economist's groundbreaking contributions to the field. His over five decades as a pioneering economist share an underlying theme. That is to put people as we know them. From the 1960s through to the early 80s, Professor Phelps challenged existing economic notions on intertemporal trade-offs and developed his highly influential golden rule on capital accumulation. If you have taken an undergraduate economics course, you would undoubtedly <coughs> recognize his contributions in the expectations augmented Phillips curve. Professor Phelps continued to focus on structuralist macroeconomics right till the end of the century. As a proponent of economic dynamism, he played a pivotal role in the economic restructuring of former Soviet Eastern European economies. In the 21st century, Professor Phelps became the founding director on capitalism and society at Columbia University, where he elaborated on the concept of mass flourishing, looking into the more intangible aspects of human ambition. Professor Edmund Phelps, a man distinguished for his dedication, not only to the field of economics, nor limited to the borders of his country, but also to humanity at large. Today, we are incredibly grateful to have Professor Phelps share his invaluable insights on the topic of innovation. And I'm sure that everyone, both in person and virtually, is eager. So without further ado, please, can I get a big round of applause for Professor Edmund Phelps? Okay. All right, here we go. There we go. Thank you. Basta! <laughs> For all you Italian students out there, basta. Um, that's one uh, wonderful exception. Great joy. Now, my talk was um, originally uh, conceived of as uh, for uh, very old uh, economists who could afford to go to Trento uh, up in Italy uh, for a festival of economics. And then the next time I gave this talk, it was at a, at a Nobel Prize thing. And the, most of the people sitting there were, had Nobel Prizes. So this is the first time that um, I'm uh, going to present, the first time that I presented, will be the first time I have presented uh, this talk to a much different audience. But I think that you might have fun with some of it and, and, and find, be intrigued by some of it. And, uh, and, uh, and you will be able to see from, from my text uh, what, what, I, what I've done here and why I went there and, um, and more. So, <clears throat> so my, my topic, I don't know whether my assistant provided that ever, uh, is indigenous innovation, roots and rewards, the rise and the fall. Um, <clears throat> innovation became a topic of economists early in the century, beginning with the huge interest of the new members of the Georgia, of the German historical school. Arthur Spiethoff was perhaps the first to express a view on the source of the innovation uh, arising around him, though his lengthy work on innovation appeared only in 1925. Another member of the German historical s school, if we agree to put him there, um, is uh, the Swede, Gustav Kassel. He noted the steady progress, prog progress that was going on uh, around him. In, in his towering work, Theory of Social Economy, 
written before World War I, just before World War I, and published in 1918. And then there was the Austrian Joseph Schumpeter. Wrote, he wrote broadly on the innovation of nations in his first book, Theory of Economic Development, published in late 1911. The theory of innovation they advanced became the foundation for the growth models that excited the economics profession in the second half of the 20th century. I'll be coming back to that later. It closed what could have been a loose end in the body of neo neoclassical economics beginning to grow up around 1900. <coughs> I noticed that neoclassical economics is uh, under the under attack. And um, fortunately, my, my presentation here won't land me in uh, um, neoclassical economics, so I expect I can get out safely tonight. Um, <clears throat> so let me set, talk now about the neoclassical theory of innovation that, that, that grew up. In the view of the people I was just uh, noting, a view that came to be increasingly accepted, all innovations are commercial applications of discoveries made by the world's explorers or increasingly scientists working mostly in laboratories. Thus, innovations are thought to derive from actors outside the nation's economy, as we would normally conceive it. Economists and laymen alike went on viewing innovation as exogenous to the economy over the rest of the 20th century. Schumpeter, in his book, went farther than Spitov and Kassel with his thesis that commercial application of these discoveries requires an Unternehmer. I figured we're so close to Germany here, we could use an occasional German word, uh, but I won't go overboard. Um, an entrepreneur capable enough to undertake the project, to raise the needed capital, recruit the needed personnel, and develop the newly possible product to get the job done, as Schumpeter liked to say. A successful entrepreneur must also weigh the project's profitability, the price to be obtained for the new thing, and the cost of making it. With this understanding of innovation, the German historical school reigned, re regained the eminence of an earlier time, an earlier version of the historical school, and with this extension, and with and with his extension of this theory of innovation, scientists plus entrepreneurs, Schumpeter became world famous, and even more so with the English translation in 1934. For economic theorists, this breakthrough by the German historical school provided a welcome extension of neoclassical theory. The theory begun by Ricardo, Walras, Marshall, Bern Bawerk, Irving Fisher, et al. In this theory, information is perfect and knowledge is complete. The increase in production possibilities brought by scientific discoveries are known immediately and costlessly. Schumpeter commented, I say in a, re, in a remark in parentheses, Schumpeter commented that the commercial applications made possible by the new, new, by the new knowledge were obvious. Thus, the advance in products and methods in a nation, its innovation, are exogenous to the nation's economy. The historical school never managed, never imagined that a flow of innovations might spring from a wide range of people working inside firms. 
Schumpeter was explicit in his belief that business people lack the creativity that might lead them to conceive of innovations. <coughs> innovations beyond those made obvious by discoveries of scientists and explorers. I recall he wrote somewhere, but I can't find it. I looked feverishly for it, that he had never met a businessman who showed the slightest creativity. This contribution of the historical school to neoclassical economics gained importance when it, when it was made the foundation, or when it, when it became the foundation on which formal theories of economic growth were built in the post-war years. Beginning with the growth models built by Robert Solow and Trevor Swan. In these and later growth models, the productivity of labor, also the, 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 the and, and the productivity of labor and capital get together, and the growth of total factor productivity, uh, ultimately will grow exponentially at the rate of technical progress which is viewed as exogenous to any <clears throat> conceptual thinking by actors in the nation's economy. <clears throat> modifications of the Schumpeterian theory, um, modifications of the Schumpeterian theory appeared in the work of Richard Nelson and Sidney Winter from the 1960s to the 1980s and that of Philippe Aguillon and Peter Howitt from the 1990s to 2009. Both parties were, both parties took a step beyond the German historical school in recognizing that qualified personnel with a background in science can make some discoveries while working inside corporations not only inside National Science Foundations, university labs, and home garages. Yet these extensions by Nelson and Winter, Ego and Howitt, did not drive out the German, the German school's powerful influence over the emerging neoclassical theory the growth models after Solo and Swan. At no point in the century of high innovation in the West, from the 1860s to the 1960s, did any economist suggest that scientists and explorers might not have been the main source that fueled the extraordinary explosion of innovation in the West. This supposed exogeneity of, of, of innovation raised a question in my mind. However important the entrepreneur is, the unternehmer, um, important the entrepreneur is, let me see whether I can get this sentence right. However important However important the entrepreneur may have been in selecting innovations to develop, <clears throat> was the German historical school basically right about the source of the new ideas spark, sparking innovation? It is important to recognize that many of the national economies in the West were exploding with innovation from the middle decades of the 19th century to the middle decades of the 20th century. And Britain, by the way, was certainly one part of that. Important innovations had begun to occur in the West with the end of the Napoleonic Wars and had spread widely by the, six, by the 1860s, first in Britain, then America, and soon after in Germany, France, and Sweden, later Italy and Finland. New cities sprouted up and new ways of life arose. 
this widespread innovating in several nations for two kinds of fruit. First, productivity data indicate a takeoff of economic growth in one country after another, although wage rates were slow to take off in Britain. And, and in America, immigration must have been a, a, a damper on, on uh, the rise of wages. Second, and also important even then, increasing numbers of people became engaged in their work and excited by the opportunities that came their way. The question now is, does the German historical school's theory of exogenous innovation adequately explain the eruption of innovating over this period and, this, and the subsequent decline of this extraordinary innovating? Or is there another theory that does explain these phenomenal developments? Well, yes, there is another theory, which the theory that I've tried to, uh, that, I've, that I have introduced and, and uh, worked hard to, uh, to uh, explain well. A new theory in my 2013 book, Mass Flourishing, <clears throat> and tested in the 2020 book, Dynamism, in those books, a key part of the widespread innovation found, according to those books, a key part of the widespread innovation found in several nations in the West derived from the outpouring of fresh ideas springing from the imagination and creativity of people working in the nation's businesses. Most of them ordinary people, as I like to say. In familiar parlance, the supply of innovation, the amount of, amount of innovation per working person is a function of these people's exercise of creativity, their expression of, their expression of creativity. This new theory of the supply of indigenous innovation is in sharp contrast to the theory of supply advanced by the German historical school, which, as, as you understand by now, which held that innovations derived from discoveries made outside the economy and outside its businesses. These new ideas pouring out of society came from a range of people. The new ideas in, in the country I mentioned in the country in the, in the times that I, I, I specified. These new ideas pouring out of society came from a range of people, most of them <coughs> excuse me, having no experience experimenting in laboratories or exploring the great beyond. The renowned British historian, Paul Johnson, in his chronicle, The Birth of the Modern, love that book, portrays many of the people whose, many of the people whose inventiveness and determination sparked the many innovations in Britain in the 15 years from the Napoleon War up to uh, 1830 or so. The noted Harvard economist Frank Tausig, thinking of the uh, American scene, famously attributed the exploration of uh, innovation in New England that he was studying, attributing it to Yankee ingenuity, not to scientists or explorers. Many people, in all works of life were drawn into the firms where they worked to where they worked in to in order to take part in the transformation going on a romantic desire or as maybe I should say the romantic desire to join to join in 
these groundbreaking activities is conveyed in the film version of Wuthering Heights when Catherine cries out, go Heathcliff, bring back the world. Yet, what accounts, it might be asked, for the emergence of aspirations and visions leading to the flow of new methods and products? Of course, there had to be companies with sole or, and sole proprietorships having a sense of opportunities in their industry for developing new methods and products. There had to be some size of the commercial demand for various products. These desires and expectations determine, you might say, the demand for innovation. But what accounts for a society's supply of its new ideas? Evidently, the bubbling up of these new commercial ideas, which began in one nation after another over the 19th century, the second half of the 19th century, was fueled by newfound desires of people to create new ways and new things. Yet it might be asked, why did such indigenous innovation with its job satisfaction for many people and widespread productivity gains in most industries arise in these nations, these nations, well, not in other nations? Puzzle. In the theory of this widespread innovating set out in my book, Mass Flourishing, the wellspring of innovation was the desire to conceive new methods and products. This reflected a newfound character among the people, or a great many of them. A character that had been evolving and developing in much of the West over two centuries and had spread widely among nationals by the middle of the 19th century. There was a willingness and a desire to create new ways and new things born of this new, uh, new sense, this new, uh, this new wellspring. Of course, such a development would not have been possible had there not been a rising number over the 17th and 18th century, centuries, who, had there not been a rising number of people over the 17th and 18th, 19th, 18th, 17th and 18th centuries who grasped the Renaissance idea that people are born with some creativity. Thus, ordinary people came to understand that creating things was possible and might not be uncommon. But what stimulated many people working in the economy to make use of this creativity they had? It's one thing to recognize, gee, I could do something, but is there a, a place for that? What drove uh, a desire to find opportunities uh, to create stuff. In this thesis of mine, in Mass Flourishing, the force driving people to conceive innovation was the rise and spread of certain modern values. Individualism, which does not mean selfishness. Individualism, vitalism, and a desire for self-expression. Individualism is the acceleration of being independent, of making one's own way. Vitalism is the notion we feel alive when we are acting on the world, when we take a chance and journey into the unknown. And self-expression is the gratifying sense that comes from making use of one's imagination and creativity, voicing one's thoughts or showing one's talents. And being inspired to imagine 
and create a new way or a new thing, people may reveal a part of who they are. Mass Flourishing argues that powered by their innate creativity and driven by their modern values, a great many people were able and eager to, to engage in projects to create new ways or new things to make, it, make and sell. And many succeeded in their efforts. Consumers thrilled at the new goods too. <clears throat> I like uh, uh, quoting the following. <clears throat> In America, where innovation began <clears throat> exploding in the late 1850s, Abraham Lincoln, after his tour of the nation, <clears throat> he was campaigning, he was thinking about campaigning for the presidency. <clears throat> he was struck at people's enthusiasm at seeing innovations sprouting up in stores and shops and exclaimed that these people, people in general, have a passion, a perfect rage for the new. By the 1880s, in Britain and America, Germany, France, and several other countries, a huge number of new products and markets were emerging from the business sector. Indigenous innovations, largely born of the new ideas hit upon by a wide number of participants in the business sector of the economy, not mainly the fruit of exogenous discoveries made by scientists and explorers. This huge outpouring of indigenous innovation conceived by modern people came to dwarf the exogenous innovation <coughs> deriving from the discoveries of scientists and, and explorers. In this new epoch with its modern spirit, ordinary people, not just scientists and explorers, had original ideas a great many, of, great many of which were conceived for commercial use. This was not altogether unprecedented. Human beings have been found to possess as long ago as the Stone Age, the ability to create objects for use. And apparently the need to express their creativity. In the nations fueled by this new spirit, a modern economy developed the typical industry had workers, managers, or other employer, employers who hit upon new ideas at one time or another. A great many people started their own firms in order to promote the adoption uh, of the new thing they were offering. In the highly innovative nations, America, Britain, Germany, and France, from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th, most innovations arising were exogenous, were, were not exogenous to their, to their economies. They derive from the creativity possessed by the large number of people inside the nation's economy. These nations had sufficient dynamism, the power and desire to innovate, and the sufficient population to make it matter, to generate a large flow of indigenous innovation. Now, all that is sort of hypothesis. Um, most or all of it found in, in mass flourishing. Um, but I realized as the decade went on that I was going to have to look for statistical evidence. And um, I called upon my um, research team Raicho Bojilov, Jan Tekhoun, and Gilfi Zuega uh, to uh, do some research. <clears throat> that resulted in the book Dynamism, published in 2020. Um, and um, 
Raicha Bojla, did I mention them? Raicha Bojlov, Yan Takun, Yikdolfi Zwega. Um, this book first presents a set of data from 1890 to 1910 on the steep rise of indigenous innovation that began in the UK, the US, France, Germany, and Italy, and a set of data on the resumption of indigenous innovation in the US, France, and Italy from 1950 to 1972. What best explains this wide innovation? Conceivably, this high innovation was a result, conceivably, uh, of an outpouring of scientific discoveries in the world, as Kassel and Spiedhoff would have thought, or the result of a heightened willingness among entrepreneurs to undertake the development of new ideas, as Schumpeter might have thought. But that theory does not explain at all well some of the striking data. Calculations by Raicho Bojilov reveal that for about a century, innovation was consistently impre impressive in some countries and consistently meager in, in some other nations. Over the post-war period, after World War II, um, after that period of high innovation, indigenous, indigenous uh, rates were strikingly high in the US, 1.02, High in the UK, 0 0.76, high in Finland. While indigenous innovation was strikingly low in Germany, 0.42, Italy, 0 0.40, and France, 0 0.32. From the perspective of Schumpeter's theory, the latter nations must have had too few entrepreneurs Indeed, I've heard people talk that way. From the perspective of the new modern theory, though, the one that I'm advancing, it can be seen as striking evidence of huge differences among G7 nations in the dynamism of the people in the workforce. <clears throat> That was Raicho's work. An, an analysis of data by Gilfie Zuega shows that among people in the OECD countries, those possessing high strength doses of the modern values, US, Ireland, Australia, Denmark, less so Switzerland, Switzerland Austria, Austria UK, Finland and Italy did have relatively high rates of indigenous innovation as the new theory of innovation predicts. Another dimension of society's gain from having modern values is its job satisfaction. Zoega's analysis shows that the countries most endowed with the right values tended to have the most job satisfaction. <coughs> In another analysis, <clears throat> Brodjilov shows the estimated time path. This is really incredible. Brodjilov shows the estimated time path of Schumpeterian innovation, 1890 to 20, 2012, shows that to be well below the estimated time path of indigenous nation of, in, of indigenous innovation in every one of the innovation nations, the US, France, and UK, also Italy and Germany. On the whole, Schumpeterian innovation hardly appears in the chart. These four studies gave exciting evidence of the power of a people's dynamism 
and an exciting test of the great power of in indigenous innovation over exogenous innovation. Dynamism of the people, one. The existing in in investigations of, of economic performance have attributed them to performances and in institutions, thus paying little or attention to values. These findings, I think, are hugely important. Where there is much dynamism, there is also an abundance of its fruits, achieving, succeeding, prospering, and flourishing. Where it is lacking, there is a joyless society. And I wonder whether today we're in that joyless society. Values are subject to change, however. The modern values that reached a critical mass in the 19th century though initially articulated in much earlier epochs, were not strong enough at first to overcome other values. Now it may be wondered whether some of the values that once fueled the dynamism in the West have weakened and whether some competing values have strengthened. Now, I want to talk about the decline of innovation and its causes. The roots of high innovation once widespread in the West understood uh, with the roots of the high innovation in the West understood, once we understand these roots, we can address the problem that arose by the 1970s. Innovation had diminished severely, first in Germany, then Britain, later Italy, and lastly, France, uh, lastly, America and France. Total factor productivity growth, by which historical standards had been rapid, uh, um, no, I think I'll just skip that. Now, in America and Germany, and especially France and Italy, the growth rates of total factor productivity since, two, two, since 2005 have fallen to grave levels. The economic costs in the West of, of the loss of innovation are serious. The resulting near stagnation of wage rates is deeply, deeply disturbing to workers who had grown up believing that their wages would be rising enough to provide them the standard of living markedly better than they saw when growing up. As capital investments were running into diminishing returns, no longer offset by technical progress, much capital formation has been discouraged. As real interest rates sunk to lower levels, the price of many assets such as houses rose inexorably from 1973 to 2019 to fewer and ever people. The social costs of all this are also serious. The loss of indigenous innovation may have brought a serious decline of the meaningful work that once engaged employees and brought, and brought them considerable job satisfaction. Those who had been engaged in the conception and development of new products and methods must have felt deprived of these deeply felt rewards. What are the causes of all this? Some observers, including adherents of the neoclassical school, might attribute the large loss of innovation to an unexplained fall off in the rate at which scientists are making discoveries. Others who have stressed the importance of institutions, such as Darren Asamoglu, have argued that the corruption that has risen in many corporations has surely weakened the interest that most firms in most industries had in innovating. Still others, such as Thomas Philippon, 
have argued that the monopoly power of the, you know, the new corporations arising with the new information technologies have been able to keep out any further startups. My book, Mass Flourishing, points to a rise in America of the corporatism that rose in Hungary, Portugal, and Italy in the interwar years. A term introduced by Mussolini, meaning a national economic system in which the important corporations are largely directed uh, by the state. Now we have something like that, except the corporations direct the state. Um, that's sort of a semi-joke. Certainly, uh, the, sense in a, the sense in a company that a new venture might not have the support of, of, an, of the nation's leadership uh, would dampen incentives to, to develop new concepts and discourage people from uh, dreaming up new concepts. However, I would argue that the decline of innovation is attributable in large part to deterioration of key values that, that once fueled the dynamism of the people. There is much evidence of that deterioration. A chapter of Mass Flourishing uh, considers that the horrific rise of the money culture in John Dewey's term may weaken a nation's dynamism. Now, the later book, a, a, a later book, The Decadent Society by Ross Duta, describes over a wide canvas the deterioration of the new character of Americans in recent years. <clears throat> but I now, but I sense now the problem is, is bigger than that. There may be a kind of multiplier at work, a contraction in the supply of modern values decreases the amount of economic growth supply, economic growth supplied, and this demoralizing fall of growth may induce a further loss of values. Although we don't have, don't have broad data on empirical measures of the decline in values that I have argued here are important to broad, to, uh, are important. It does appear that all or any, at all or at any rate, the bulk of values that are required for widespread innovating throughout society have declined appreciably over the brilliant years of the West's past. Now, Western societies, some more than others, are in crisis. Data from the GSS survey so show the reported satisfaction, job satisfaction in America has been on a downhill slide since 1972. Pew Research Center surveys from the early 1970s to recent years show a downward trend in the reported degree of life satisfaction. And Case and Ang Angus Deaton in deaths of despair show data on the outbreak of despair in America, linking it to the developments there. Now, dissatisfaction and despair are rather widespread. Excuse me, I'll get it later. Um, <clears throat> oh, thank you very much. Um, we economists have not recognized <clears throat> that for several decades, people want, people in the, in the West at least, uh, want rich lives. They need an economy uh, in which jobs are interesting, engaging, and occasionally fun too. A good life, a life of richness as some humanists call it, means, for one thing, an occasional sense of succeeding, <clears throat> the feeling of prospering when your ships come in or you gain recognition. The good life also means a kind of flourishing, using one's imagination, exercising one's creativity, 
journeying into the unknown and acting on the world. A good economy holds out expectations of a good life, but a good life in much of society is more and more an unmet need. We may wonder whether the key values can be restored without a change of society. A new vision is required, I think. I feel it may be necessary to reconceive the economy in which people devote their working lives. It is hugely important in, in my view that governments, state and local, and thought makers draw away from a focus bordering on obsession with material gains, hence a focus on income and wealth. The main business of this new economy that I am trying to imagine would be engaged in, would be creating the new. I envision an economy that is in large part a sprawling space with myriad studios for creating things, an economy full of people in the business of creating things. In this new world, work is very engaging and retiring from such work would be like retiring from life. People need to realize their talents and aspirations. We economists ought to design an economy organized to enable people to have such working lives. Thank you very much. Okay, you lose credibility if you go on much longer. Uh, um, bad joke. Um, so um, I, I, I swore that uh, I would uh, quit while I'm ahead. Um, I've had um, kind of a tough period in the early part of the week and I'm a bit tired, but I've also persuaded myself that it would be terrible if I don't try to take at least one or maybe two questions. Yes. Uh, can we get a mic down here, please? Thank you. Maybe I could sit down on this. Yeah, sure. That's sure, what they're for. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Maybe I might join you. Can you see me? Mostly, mostly. Yes, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, and it's such an honor that I have an opportunity to ask you a question. My name is Yeso, South Korean. I, for me, you have to boom it out. Twice the volume. Oh, good evening. It's okay. such an honor. That's good. That I have an opportunity to make, have a question to you. My name is Yeso, South Korean, studying in Mexico City. Uh, my question is that uh, this is the first time for me to be in England, and I feel happy that I'm not forced to tip here, unlike America. So what is your opinion about tipping culture as part of capitalism, which I would consider as a Korean and happy in England, that maybe it's part of a capitalism that kind of pushes the obligation or responsibility of employers to pay well to the workers, that they push this responsibility to the clients to pay them, the tipping culture. Because especially in the States, now they're kind of recommending to tip like 18%, 22%. So what do you think about part of this capitalistic system of tipping? Thank you. Well, I missed a lot of that. You know, the Sonics are a, a little less than great. <clears throat> um, and I'm uh, less, my hearing is less than great too. That's probably most of it. Um, well, you, 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 you bring up capitalism. Um, I think it's clear from what I said on the last page that um, 
I'm leaving plenty of room for, for something that's way outside of uh, capitalism or, or any ordinary uh, concept of, of uh, capitalism. But, um, and to some extent, I may be wandering from your question, but I got to do what I do. Um, I, I think that um, for a long time, for this foreseeable future, uh, an advanced, an economically advanced country will find uh, important value in, in uh, having a capitalist sector. Um, there are a lot of advantages from the way that's structured, the opportunities for people to sell their new ideas. Uh, also, you know, the spectacular innovations that I was talking about in my talk came from workers working in capitalist companies. They weren't working for the government, sad to say. And um, so, you know, we don't want to throw out, what is that expression about? Throwing out the something or other. <laughs> throwing out the baby for, whatever, anyway. never mind. Um, um, we, we have to be very careful and um, I don't say we have to be continuously move continuously, but but we have to take one step at a time, and to some extent, seeing whether those previous steps look like they went that we're in the right direction. Um, yes, the second question. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Uh, and I'm, my name is Joel, and I'm from Bocconi University, in Milan. Wait a minute. Where's the mic? Okay. I'm Here. smiling at the wrong person. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, thank you first of all for the speech. It has been very insightful. And I'm my name is Joel, and I'm a student from Bocconi University, in Milan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said he's a student from. From Bocchini University. Uh, okay. Bocchini University. Great. Great. What's Thank the you. next step? What's, uh, can you proceed to your question, please? Yes. So, I mean, according to standard economic thought, uh, patents have been, uh, maybe it's better, maybe, without mic. I don't know, because uh, there's a bit. I think let's keep the mic on. Okay. So, I mean, according to standard economic thought, uh, patents have been generally regarded as uh, tools to foster innovation, allowing uh, innovators to appropriate the profits from innovation, undercutting the rivals. But uh, there has been a research, for example, in uh, the case against patents, in which uh, the authors say that, for example, there's no empirical evidence that uh, patents okay, lead... Okay, okay. I, 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 th I think I get the, the, the gist, uh, the drift of the question. Um, also about capitalism. Uh, no, I mean, I, I just would like uh, a comment on yours about uh, patents and uh, their... Uh, their uh, functioning in the economy as a way to promote innovation. Yeah. I, I believe the gentleman's asking for your thoughts on patents and their function in the economy. Patents, yes. Yeah, patents. And, and uh, I, I pronounce it differently. Um, <laughs> it's okay, it's across the pond. Well, Well, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm afraid I'm not uh, really, uh, I'm not with the adjust to this question. Um, I think you're talking about incentives. 
to innovate? Yeah, I, I believe they're talking about the role of patents in today's world. Oh. About how you yeah. believe that may have changed. I, um, I really have no idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I treasure the feeling that it doesn't matter very much. Um, um, I think there are two sorts of phenomena going on. Well, there, there are some people who engage in innovation for the joy of it, and uh, what 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 their post the, the, their their ability to patent it is, is probably not the driving force. And then there are other uh, more commercial folk who who uh, are seeking uh, to innovate in order to get costs low, lower in order to survive or something like that. Um, they're not looking, they're not finding an enjoy in what they do, but they're, they are seeking to innovate in order to stay in the game. Um, so the, yeah, there are different, they're different, uh, different kinds of experience. Uh, I don't uh, know uh, what I might say about that. I clearly, from my remarks on my last page, uh, I'm a I'm groping my way toward a vision of an economy in which a lot of people are just creating. Maybe they don't get to do that for their whole lives, because some other people need to have uh, that opportunity. But there are a lot of people where, where, where society has provided a, a, a space for people to exercise creativity. Uh, it's a shame if uh, a lot of people's, the people don't, a lot of people don't ever have a chance to, uh, show their creativity um, because there was a lack of business interest. And, and uh, so that's what I, I was having in mind is uh, there could be a sector of the economy in which uh, the state um, provides uh, support for people to express their creativity, develop new stuff, and uh, have their turn at um, the good life. I think I will stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Professor Phelps, it was a great privilege to hear about your fascinating speech on innovation and mass flourishing. And I believe that I speak on behalf of everyone here in saying that each and every one of us has something to reflect on the nature of the human drive. After listening to your speech, I for one cannot wait to read your upcoming book. I believe it's titled My Journeys in Economic Theory. Yes, my, um, I had the audacity to decide somewhere in the fifth or sixth month of the virus that uh, I was dying of boredom, I decided to see whether I can write my memoirs. And uh, golly, I did, I wrote them. And uh, may I say it'll be published in May or June? <laughs> no, April or May, April or May.